there. Uh, my name is Sarah Tiang, and I'm a children's author and a poet who lives here in Kingston, Ontario. Um, I've lived in the beautiful city of Kingston for the last 14 years. This is my first time doing an Instagram live video, so I hope that it's all okay. I've actually got my phone up and supported by some plasticine, so we'll see how it goes. Um, today I wanted to read to you a couple of my books, so I thought I would start with A Flock of Shoes, which was my very first book, and then we'll move on to my book, Sugar and Snails. And of course, if anybody has any questions or wants to say anything, please feel free. I'm looking at people as they join, so hello. It's nice to know that I'm not all alone out there. <laughs> um, okay. So we'll start with A Flock of Shoes. And this is a story that was actually inspired by a playground um, in Kingston. So uh, right by where I live, there's um, a beautiful woolen mill with a gorgeous restaurant in it. And right across from that is a playground with some swings. And I used to go there all the time with my daughter. And we would swing, and she would swing so hard that her shoes would often come out. Okay, so let's start. I hope everybody can see this pretty well. Abby loved her sandals. They were pink and brown with lime green trim. They were perfect for running and walking and skipping. And jumping. When she hopped in them, she felt as light as air. And we actually have a little doggy too, um, but our dog is too big to go on Abby's back these days. There we go. They made small heart, sorry. They made small heart tracks in the sand and followed her all around the beach. They invited the wind to come and kiss her toes. Abby and her sandals had a wonderful summer together. I can't wait for summer and I can't wait to wear my sandals too. But when fall came, her mother tried to take them away. Your feet will be too cold. Your sandals are getting worn. You're starting to outgrow those shoes. But Abby's mother was often full of nonsense. One bright fall day at the park, Abby was swinging with her favorite sandals on. Abby was swinging higher than she had ever done before. She swung so high that her sandals flipped right off her feet. First one, then the other. But her sandals didn't land with a plop. Sand. And her sandals didn't land with a thunk on the grass. Her sandals flipped and flopped in the sky, pretty as birds, and joined another couple of pair of sandals all in a V. Now I know this, this has happened to a lot of you because that sandal migration, which happens every year when it starts to get cold. They were headed south, and you can see Abby here is saying goodbye to them, and there they go. Abby had to walk home in her socks. Doesn't she look sad? Okay, <laughs> I don't have this memorized, so I have to check it too. And then, when she told her mother, her mother huffed about fibs and got out Abby's brand new boots. Poor Abby, her mom doesn't believe her. All winter long in her boots, Abby thought about her sandals. You can see here, she's making a little sandals out of the snow. She wondered if they were making hearts in white sand. She thought about how the warm wind liked to tickle the open spots. She hoped that they were getting enough exercise. 
I hope everybody's remembering to exercise their shoes out there because without it, your shoes can get really lazy. And then I think it's this really interesting thing, which is called a postcard. So a postcard you get in the mail, and on one side you see a picture, and here on the picture you can see it's a couple of sandals playing beach volleyball. And her postcard says, Wish you were here. The weather is warm, the sand is soft, but we still miss the tickle of your toes. So I wonder who sent those to her. And then she gets another postcard here, and here you can see the sandals are enjoying a nice beach, a beautiful sunset, and it says, To Abby, thought about your heels today. We miss you to the bottom of our souls. And then lastly, Abby gets one more postcard. And here you can see there are sandals, and they're dancing in grass skirts around a fire. And it says, Our straps are aching to hold you again. Okay, but back to Abby and her boots. Eventually, around February, Abby began to really love her boots. They were white and blue and had a lovely trim of purple that went all around the edges. You can see she can run and play very well in her boots. They were great for stomping and running and kicking and climbing. You can see, there she is. They made squiggles and squares and tiny circle tracks in the snow. See all of her footprints and what she can do? They followed her all throughout the white woods. They hugged her toes with their soft, fuzzy felt interior. Then, one warm spring day, as Abby was putting on her sandals, she heard the whistle of the northbound train. And uh-oh, look at this, she's putting on sunscreen, but her sandals are going. Her boots snapped to attention and were out the door before Abby could call to them. She ran out after them in her bare feet, but look, there's a train there. Abby's trying to catch them. Sorry. But they were already joining another line of rugged boots, running and hopping on the boxcars as the train chugged by. The sweet sound of harmonica music and the beat of stomping boots floated on the breeze. Abby sat in the new grass and waved sadly goodbye to her beloved sandals. Until she heard the swish of flying sandals. They landed gracefully from the sky, parting from a large flock of shoes, and they were at glorious pink and brown with lime green trim. They were rested and fat, grown just wide enough for Abby's feet. See? They're just perfect for her feet now. I think everybody's going to have to start getting out their own sandals soon. And then, on the very last page, what we have here is a postcard. But this postcard isn't from her sandals anymore. This postcard is from her book, from her boots. And it says, early nights and gorgeous lights, but we still miss the warm wiggle of your toes. Hope to see you soon. And it's got beautiful lights in the background. Now, when we first made this book, and I looked at this picture, and in the text, it was supposed to be Northern Lights, and I thought it was. But then I went on a trip up north to read my books to kids up north, and I said to them, okay, so what are the boots looking at? And they said, we have no idea. I said, what do you mean you have no idea? It's the Northern Lights. And they said, no, the Northern Lights are only ever green and blue. <laughs> they said it's not pink. So that is something that I learned. So it's a little bit of creativity there. Shouldn't actually be pink. Northern Lights should actually be green, but still fun anyway. So um, if you want to do an activity related with Block of Shoes on Visit Kingston's um, Instagram site, we put up the postcards. 
So what you can do is you can color in the, you can print them off, then color in the postcards, and then you can go ahead and turn it around and write a postcard to somebody that you love and tell them how you're doing, because I know that we don't get to see as many people as we like to see these days. So um, that's a nice, fun thing to do. Okay, I wanted to um, read you another story. This one is called Sugar and Snails. And this one is a little bit more recent than A Flock of Shoes. In fact, I think Sugar and Snails is my latest children's book. So this one is based on an old, old rhyme. And I wrote this one right after um, my son was born. So there's an old rhyme. And I don't know if you guys can see it okay, but it says, what are little boys made of? Frogs and snails and puppy dog tails. What are little girls made of? Sugar and spice and everything nice. And I thought, that's not what my kids are made out of. So I thought it might be fun to write a book about what kids are actually made out of. So here we've got a grandpa and he's talking with his two grandkids. So we've got a little daughter here and we've got a little boy here. And the grandpa says, pass me the sugar, would you? And as he's putting the sugar into his copy, he says, let's see, a little sugar, a pinch of spice, just like that old rhyme about sweet girls like you. And the little boy says, what about sweet boys like me? And the grandpa says, hmm, it's about boys and girls. I think it goes something like this. What are little boys made of? And then here he's thinking about what the little boys are made of. And he says, pirates and dogs and noisy bullfrogs. What are little girls made of? Dresses and sweets and everything neat. You can see she's in a great big dress there. But the little girl says, I don't wear dresses. And the little boy says, and I don't like frogs. And the grandpa says, Oh, you don't, do you? Okay, so boys are made of cookies and spice and jump roping mice. And girls are made of snails and rocks and butterfly socks. And you can see she's got little butterfly socks going on there. And then here we've got a whole scene in the kitchen. And there's the boy launching off the toaster. And he says, maybe it was boys are made of lightning and newts and rubber rain boots. See the big rubber rain boots? And the boy says, I do love boots. And girls are made of boats and whales and dinosaur tails. Doesn't she have a great tail? I wish I had a tail like that. And then he says, well, maybe it was boys are made of balloons and mutts and fresh chicken butts. I think there's a good chance boys are made out of chicken butts. And the boy says, well, girls are made of monkeys and dirt and lemon dessert. And then here's the boy here and it says, or it could be that boys are made of flowers and swings and bumblebee wings. Look at his beautiful wings and all the flowers coming out of him. And then we've got this girl and it says, and girls are made of tires and slides and crazy fast rides. Like she's going so fast that she actually needs goggles on. Here we go. And some boys are made of marbles and fish and all things that squish. And girls can be made of snakeskins and pies and bright fireflies. I think if I was anything, I would be this one because I love snakeskins. Finding them always exciting. And pie is my very favorite dessert in the whole wide world. And I always go crazy every time I see fireflies out in the yard. I have to go out and dance with them. 
And then the grandfather gives up. And he says, dang it, I give up. What in the world are you made of? And you can see the boy has got a dinosaur tail and a tutu and a crown and shoes and monkey mask. And the girl has got an ape suit and flower glasses and a pirate hat. And they are just made out of all sorts of fun things, I think. And then at the very end, they're taking it apart. And it says, what are little boys made of? Frogs and snails and, oh, I think they're going to put their own thing in there. What are little girls made of? Sugar and, I think they're going to figure it out. So that's a question I had for you, actually. I'm wondering what everybody is made of. So I told you some of my favorite things, which is snake skins and pies and fireflies. And I thought that a fun activity, one thing that I've done with my own kids is we make a collage of something that is all of your favorite things, all of the things that if you could say, what's inside of me, it would be on this collage. So a good thing to do is to take some old magazines and find the things that you absolutely love. And you can call it a collage about me. And you take some glue and you put it all on together so that people can see what kind of person you are. So that was my book, Sugar and Snails. Okay. I also wanted to talk a little bit, um, because I do have an activity for this. This is a book called Warriors and Whalers. And it's 100 Ancient Chinese Jobs You Might Have Relished or Reviled. So what this book is about is this is a book about of nonfiction. And it's for kids who are usually about, I'd say, the age of 8 to maybe 11. And it talks about the kinds of stuff that they did in ancient China. So we've got all sorts of really interesting jobs. Like there was somebody who um, would just take care of the Pekingese dogs, which are royal dogs. And these dogs didn't even have to walk in the yards. They had their own servants. And the servants would hold these like silk platforms and they would bring the dogs into the garden and they would paint beautiful pictures of puppies for the dogs so that the, when the dogs were pregnant, they could look at the beautiful pictures of puppies and have beautiful, beautiful puppies. And if anybody was found with a Pekingese that wasn't part of the royal family, then they would get in big, big, big trouble. Um, there was lots of, oh, here's an interesting job. So this one is a physiognomist. So her job was to look at people and judge them on the way that they looked, which is something that we don't encourage now. But at the time, her job was to say, oh, I see that you have a nose that looks like a wolf. So that means that you're going to be like a really aggressive person. So they would tell people what they would be like and what kind of jobs they could have and what kind of other people they could marry. So sometimes, even if you wanted to marry somebody, if they went and they got an assessment from a physiognomist and they said, no, you're not allowed to marry because the two of you don't look together, don't look well together then you wouldn't be able to marry. This is a, a neat one too. So this one is called an endless chain worker. So to me, it kind of looks like there are two guys on a treadmill and that's basically what it is. So these guys would have been really, really fit because their whole job basically was to be on a treadmill. And one thing that when you're growing rice, you have to keep it very wet. So these guys would spend all day moving their feet so that they could flood the field with rice. So um, back then it was not very hard to keep fit at all. This one's a really fun one. So if you're a kid out there, most likely this would have been your job. This is called a night soil spreader. Now I wonder if anybody knows what night soil is, but almost every single peasant child had this job. What, what would happen is that people in the family would poop in a pot and then the kids would have to take their family's poo and spread it all over the gardens so that they could grow really good vegetables. So the next time you complain about having to unload the dishwasher, just remember that if you had lived in ancient China, you would probably have a much, much stinkier job. And I think that this one is really neat. So this job here is a silk maker. I don't know if anybody here has any clothing made of silk, but it's a really soft, lovely material. 
And silk is actually made from silk worms. So what they would do with the silk worms is they would let the worms make their cocoon. And their cocoon is actually made out of silk. And when their cocoon was made, they would boil them, and then they would be able to unravel the cocoon, and that's where you would get the silk from. So you can imagine that it took lots and lots and lots of caterpillars in order to be able to do this. So if you want to have a little bit of fun, um, visit Kingston. They put a link um, on their website, and there's a game that you can download where you can find out, uh, using revor reverse fortune cookies, what job you would have had if you had lived in ancient China. So what you do is you open up the game and then you click on any fortune cookie and it'll open up and it'll tell you what job you would have had. So it can be anything from the emperor to a slave to an acrobat to anything that would have been one of the hundred jobs in this book. Okay. I say that we have um, another 10 minutes, so um, I thought that I would maybe read to you one last book. And this book is called Dogs Don't Eat Jam and Other Things Big Kids Know. And this book is kind of special to me right now because it's about a big sister who gets a little baby brother. And um, we are expecting a new little baby in our family too. So I have a little baby inside me right now. And my daughter, who is 14, and my son, who is six, are going to be expecting a little brother soon. So they're gonna be able to do something like this. So this sister says, so you've been born, congratulations. I'm big now, but do you know what? I wasn't always this big. As your si older sister, I've put together this handy guide to life. So she's there to help them because that's what big sisters do. And then you can see all of the amazing things that she can do. It took a lot of hard work and time to get to where I am now. You might look at me and see that I can pull up my zipper, brush my hair, and tie my own shoes, mostly. I can even get up and feed the dog before mom and dad. I'm very helpful, but I wasn't always this way. I was actually born tiny, just like you. But even when I was little, I had important things to do. The first thing was to make parents. Before I was born, they weren't mom and dad. They were Wanda and Bob. I gave them a promotion. Before you, I was just me. Now I'm a big sister and you're a little brother. So you see, you've done something great already. Everything is going to be new to you. When I was, a, I was a baby so long ago, it's hard to remember, but I guess it's like going to another planet where everybody talks gobbledygook and eats with their ears. So this is what it's like for the poor baby. They have no idea what anybody's saying and they don't even know how to eat yet. You're learning how to drink milk. You'll learn to hold your head up and how to look around. Right now, you can't even tell mom or dad when your toe is itchy or you're too hot. You have to cry when something is wrong. Poor little baby. But you'll learn new things every day. You'll learn about broccoli and cheese and yams. And look, the doggy is getting to eat everything that's falling down. You'll learn that things fall down. You'll learn that a lot. You'll even learn that sounds can come out of all sorts of body parts. <clears throat> yep, just like that. If you learn how to go, it's important to learn how to stop. You'll find that you can be loud, louder, and loudest. I'll help you with that. See, there's the baby learning how to be very, very loud. You'll learn how to smile and how to laugh and even how to make other people laugh. I did, and this was before my very first birthday. See, there she is as a baby making everyone laugh. 
if there's one thing a baby wants, it's to become a toddler, which means walking around. Grown-ups are fast, so you'll have to be faster. You'll have to practice every day. I pulled myself up on chairs, on the coffee table, and on the dog. Don't try the dog. Oh, that poor doggie. I fell a lot, but I got back up again, even if I did need a little cry first. So she's showing to her baby about how she fell so many times. I never gave up, and you won't either. People clapped and cheered when I could finally get to the books on the coffee table all by myself. I think the baby's going to knock down all those books. The next thing you'll have to do is learn how to talk. Grown-ups use millions of words every day. Take it from me, it's best to learn the important ones first. And she thinks the important ones are Cookie, Mama, Up, and Daddy. But don't stop there. You'll want to name everything. You'll want to name the whole world with big words like hippopotamus and mango juice and moon. You'll spend hours learning how much cups can hold and how much they can't. We'll read piles of stories about monkeys and toothpaste and everything. Just remember not to drool on my books. You'll learn how to brush your teeth and that you're allowed to spit in certain places. That's very important. There's only a few places you're allowed to spit. Here we go. You'll, when you get bigger, you'll even get rid of diapers. I did, and I never looked back. Of course, they won't be all smooth. You'll have some trouble with mom and dad. I did when they were in their bossy stage, always telling me which way to put on my pants or where to paint, or that the dog doesn't eat jam. Take it from me, sometimes you'll get angry with mom and dad, but three minutes of quiet time is a lot longer than three minutes of TV. You'll learn that mad goes away, but love stays. Hugs can make mad go away even faster. I hate to break it to you, but there are some things you're going to have to give up. That pacifier for one, I know you love it. I had one that helped me sleep too, but that was before I slept in my big bad bed. It's hard to give up some things, but that's part of being big. When you're as big as me, you'll be able to do things without mom and dad. I had to leave them by themselves to go to kindergarten. They were very brave. Now I ride a big yellow bus and I'm learning to count as high as the sky. I can print my letters except for K and make a puppet out of toilet paper rolls. And believe it or not, little baby, one day you'll be just as big as I am, with a little help, of course. And thank goodness we have older siblings to help us teach us how to grow. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I had a really good time here. I hope you had a good time, too. Don't forget, you can do the coloring of the postcards or you can do the game for Warriors and Railers. I hope everybody stays safe out there and that everybody um, can still call their grandmas and their grandpas and say hello.